content warning. You read the title. This is about state violence and police brutality. Clips of violence will be kept to a minimum. But I will be discussing murder, institutionalization, medical abuse, and I'll be using some ableist language. So you've been warned. This is Elijah McLean. He went to a convenience store to buy iced tea for his brother, and he wore a ski mask, even though it was August, because he was cold due to anemia. This was considered suspicious behavior. On his way home, he was tackled to the ground by cops, then injected with ketamine by first responders. He died of a heart attack on the way to the hospital. He was young, black, and male. What also needs to be emphasized is that he had a disability, which made him look suspicious. And it wasn't the cops who killed him, though obviously the cops didn't help. Criminalizing Disability 33 to 50 percent of people killed by cops are disabled. This has been a commonly quoted statistic by the disability community lately. But do you know where it came from and how it was arrived at? Most non-academic articles seem to link back to this study by the Rutterman Family Foundation. As anyone who's looked into police killings knows, the data here is spotty, because often the only accounts we have of these incidents are those told by the murderers themselves. And media outlets are often disincentivized to give accurate information due to their ties with law enforcement. You're quoting my testimony, and I'm telling you that's not my testimony. And I'm asking, could you at least, if you don't want to tell those, just change those that word where the police say I'm saying help, change it to don't shoot. They refused. That clip is from the documentary Where is Hope? The Art of Murder. And I highly recommend watching it. The editing is a little bit like your grandma learned Windows Movie Maker, but the stories are powerful. It's $3 to watch on the website below, but it's well worth it. Plus, that money will be going to black disability activists, which is where money needs to be going right now anyway. There is currently no legal requirement at state or federal levels for police to note whether or not victims of their violence are disabled. We as a nation are so uncomfortable with disability, or perhaps so forgetful of its existence, that we regularly leave it out of statistics, further propagating the myth that disability is an individual problem, not an identity, and certainly not a systemically oppressed group. Some people even find it disrespectful to discuss how a person subjected to state violence is disabled, as if disability is an insult to their memory. Let me clarify here that I'm not trying to take the spotlight off of race. This is meant as an intersectional analysis. I think we in leftist communities are likely already familiar with the racial roots of state-sanctioned violence, and I don't think we need a lecture on this by a white person. So go listen to Black Voices on that. Read Angela Davis or watch her lectures or interviews on prison abolition. I'll put some resources in the description. The study by the Rutterman Family Foundation acknowledges that when disability is included in official reports, it's often used to justify murder and blame victims for their deaths. For instance, by saying someone had a mental illness. Now let's get one thing straight. People who have diagnosed mental illnesses do not commit violent acts at a higher rate than the general population, and are, in fact, far more likely to be the victims of violence. Ten times more likely than the general population, to be precise. And this statistic likely doesn't even account for all the instances of institutionalized violence that disabled people, particularly disabled people of color, experienced by the medical system. Yes, the medical system. Did you think I could talk about the murder of disabled people by police without discussing the racism inherent in the medical system? I actually can't. It's, it's really not possible for me. Medicalizing blackness to make it synonymous with violence, disobedience, and criminality in order to legitimize state-enforced racism has a history dating back to pre-emancipation. Many slaves were given the diagnosis drapedomania, which is basically running away from the plantation too much. It was considered a mental illness to run away from slavery. I feel like all of these ridiculous mental illnesses marginalized people have been diagnosed with over the years are kind of common knowledge now. But we don't often discuss the role medicalization still has to play in marginalizing people, and how ableism is used to legitimize discrimination. In order to do so, 
we have to start this discussion with two essential assumptions. One, having a medical diagnosis does not make someone a bad person. And two, being a bad person is not a medical problem. These shouldn't be contentious statements, but how often do you see people, even in leftist communities, say something like, racism is a mental illness? I don't think that her actions are conducive with somebody who is uh, a neurotypical. Are you qualified to talk about this? Or claim that racists are intellectually disabled. Having a psychiatric disability is not the same thing as having a bias against a group of people. Having uninformed, violent, or selfish ideas has nothing to do with mental health. Do you seriously think we could have diagnosed the entirety of Nazi Germany with a psychiatric or intellectual disability? We have to understand that people are a product of their environments. Sometimes environments can produce trauma, which is a medical problem. And sometimes environments are conducive to ignorance and violence, which are social and not medical problems. As for being intellectually disabled, IQ is a problematic measure. But the best definition I've seen of cognitive disability is it is a neurodivergence that results in a significant enough mismatch with the way society provides information to cause substantial difficulties in functioning. Seems like racists function pretty well on the overall. The definition doesn't apply here. Stop saying it does. However, we have to remember that our medical definitions and treatments for cognitive and psychiatric disabilities emerge from the same system as racists. This racial bias in mental health care obviously still persists, often in more subtle forms. Black children, for instance, are far more likely than white children to be given the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. Doctors often give black patients lower doses of pain medication or outright deny them medication, assuming black people are more likely to become addicted to drugs. Recreational drugs, by the way, are used at approximately the same rates by all the races. Black people are just four times as likely to be arrested for it. Black people are more likely to be treated as combative, uppity, non-compliant, lazy, or drug-seeking, criminal. Me and my boys in wheelchairs and all the time, and they met the construct that they held us because all our asses got shot and went to the shit you shouldn't have been doing. I could go on for hours about the statistics on healthcare discrepancies between the races. Suffice to say here that every aspect of medical care is worse if you're black, just like every aspect of the justice system is worse. When people suggest sending in health care workers rather than police, remember that Elijah was killed by first responders. Remember that first responders are not unarmed. Certainly a syringe of ketamine is less likely to be accidentally lethal than a gun, but we can't forget that the murder and institutionalization of marginalized people is not limited to the prison industrial complex. In the 1960s and 70s, there was a sudden surge of schizophrenia in the black community. You know, during the time when they were all crazy enough to demand equal rights. Hmm, what a coincidence. Oddly enough, at this time, deinstitutionalization also gained traction. Perhaps it had something to do with the influx of black patients in mostly white mental health institutions. But where did all these disabled people go once asylums began shutting down? That's right, prison. According to this article, federal and state jails and prisons are now home to three times as many people with mental health conditions as state mental hospitals. And people in prisons are nearly three times more likely to report having a disability as the non-incarcerated population. To be fair, disabled people were no strangers to prison. Google the phrase, ugly laws. So you know the story from here. Incarceration rates skyrocketed and Nixon made up the war on drugs. He criminalized the mental health problem of addiction and used it as an excuse to lock up and re-enslave black and disabled people, and especially black disabled people. There's a larger social context. I mean, the brutality is the end result of a psychology and a soci socialization in America that we as people with disabilities, particularly African Americans with disabilities, have no value. Thus, no value means you, you, you can be treated and talked to and handled in any way, shape, or form. The article, An Autistic Man Lives Here, Cops, No Excuses, Oh Yes, He Is Black Too, 
Cognitive Disability, Race, and Police Brutality in the United States, does an excellent job of explaining how our racist and ableist systems of confinement have historically been one and the same. To support victims of medical abuse, donate to the Health Justice Commons Medical Abuse Hotline campaign on GoFundMe, and check out their website for other intersectional health justice projects. Links in the description. Disabled people. Abolishing the police and prisons is our fight, too. It's all the same. It's another way we're institutionalized, and another way ableism is weaponized against minority groups. Remember how the Black Panthers recognized our fight is their fight. They were there cooking food for us at the 504 sit-in. Remember that disabled people continue to be institutionalized and exploited for labor, both in and outside of prisons. Enabled people. Remember that you could become disabled at any time. But don't worry, there's no shame in being less exploitable. Hey, this is Leslie after I've edited quite a bit of this video. So my friend Faye Fahrenheit is also making a video on this topic, and hers, I'm sure, is going to be really good. So you should all go see that. Okay, now this is the end. Okay, bye. <laughs>